Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Let's kick this weekend off, right? It's the end of the school year for parents and teachers. I live with both uh, students and uh, teachers, so it's a, it's a big tumultuous, changing, but exciting time. So I'm, I'm pumped today. I'm in a good mood. I'm also pumped for my guests and uh, the, the discussion we're about to have. Before we get started, I usually give you a message. This week, it's a question. This comes from uh, my dear friend, Dr. Lance Knob. It was a question he dropped in the comments on uh, my LinkedIn promotion for this show. Um, and it, we're going to kind of dissect this throughout uh, the course of the show. And his question is, by the way, Lance is uh, quite uh, the business coach and consultant himself. He's a really phenomenal guy. So if you're not privy to Lance, check him out. Dr. Lance Knob on, on all social platforms. His question is, what's the most common problem that you find preventing entrepreneurs from scaling? With that, I would like to welcome to the show Equilibria CEO. She's also a best-selling author. She has her own podcast, Alicia Butler-Pierre, all the way in Atlanta, Georgia. How are you doing today? You got to unmute. Can't hear you yet. Sorry, go. I thought, yeah. sorry about that. Thank you so much for having me, Jeremiah. My pleasure. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, correct? Correct. Nice. The Peach awesome. State. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Southern boy originally, so. Yeah, I, I saw from Chad and, yeah. uh, no, Nashville. 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 Yeah. I'll be yeah. there in a couple of months. Nice. It's a great place. <laughs> great place. Um, so yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time and you don't have to give me like a whole bio, but it, you came from an engineering background, correct? Yes. So can you kind of just describe how one comes from like a background such as engineering where you're going on this certain career path and then all of a sudden uh, you end up <laughs> as like, you know, a jet setter, like kind of a uh, front runner entrepreneur and uh, helping businesses grow. How did that transition occur? So my first job when I worked as an engineer, chemical engineer, I was working at a company called Monsanto. You're I'm sure you're familiar with Absolutely that. familiar. <laughs> Don't judge me, Jeremiah. Don't judge care. me. <laughs> you notice I left that out of the promo. <laughs> so um, let's great. just say I was I was very, very young. And I it's funny because I didn't I learned more about the company once I left than when I actually worked there. Because you're, you know, it's it's so large, you're in a silo. But what happened with me, Jeremiah, so as a chemical engineer, I really worked as what they call a process engineer. So we were making Roundup, the, the weed killer. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain, there are certain raw materials that go into making Roundup. And so I, hap I happened to work in one of those units that made the raw material that eventually becomes Roundup. And each business unit within that particular manufacturing plant was assigned an accountant. And that accountant would come and meet with you and, and everyone else who worked within that unit at least once a month. And I have to be honest with you when, I, I remember this one lady in particular, I don't remember her name, but I just remember her having these meetings with us. And it was, it was like she was speaking another language, talking about equity and liabilities and balance sheets and cash flow, profit versus revenue. It, it was like, whoa, wait a minute, what? And so I didn't realize the importance of understanding the language of business, which is, is accounting and finance, until it started to affect the way that we were producing product literally every single day. So there were these business decisions driving our production schedules, but me just having the technical knowledge and expertise, I didn't have an appreciation for those business decisions driving the production schedule. So I, I wanted to go back to school. So I, I enrolled in an MBA program where I was attending school at night, working full-time during the day. And eventually I, I did leave Monsanto and I started working at an engineering consulting firm and it was a family owned company. And that's where I was reading the description of your show, you know, talk about being bitten by that entrepreneurial bug. That's probably when it first started for me, because it was such a smaller company, the opportunity to do lots of different things came, you know, came up for me. And so being able to have 
a, a little bit of experience and seeing the true mechanics of operating a business on a day-to-day -day basis combined with what I was learning in school at night, it, it just kind of set the foundation, I would say, for when I eventually started my own company. So to, to shorten this story, <laughs> um, you know, li I was living in New Orleans, which is uh, uh, flood prone, as we all know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had this, I remember being stuck in my house, Jeremiah. This was around late August, early September, 2004. And it starts flooding and the water just kept rising and rising and rising. And let me tell you, that's a, if you've never been in a situation like that, it's a scary feeling because you're literally stuck. You can't go anywhere. I was living alone. And I just remembered having this thought, I've got to get out of here. I can't do this again. And fast forward, I, I, finished, I finished up school, finished up my MBA program that December. The following January, 2005, I put my house up for sale and I relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, where I knew one person. I actually wanted to go to New York, yeah. but, but that's a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> so I ended up in Atlanta instead. And six months later, Hurricane Katrina happened. But when I came here to Atlanta, I really thought I was going to work at Coca-Cola. They're headquartered here. Mm -hmm. I had the engineering background. I understood processes, but I also had a very strong interest in marketing. So I thought, okay, I have the engineering background, the MBA, who wouldn't hire me? But there are a lot of really smart, <laughs> talented, bright people here in Atlanta. <laughs> and so um, after two months of what seemed to be endless job searching, I just decided, you know what? maybe I need to create my own opportunity. And that's literally how Equilibria came to be. And, and what year was that? That was 2005. So I started oh. the company around April, May of 2005. So it's been 16 years. Yeah. 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 It's funny. I, well, I almost ended up in Atlanta as well, after, right out of grad school. Okay. And instead shifted and, and New York was always the, the destination, but my mm -hmm. wife, my wife almost pulled us to Atlanta. It didn't happen. Mm. Um, and and the thing I appreciate about New York and, and similar to Atlanta, like what you were talking about, is um, you know you really have to step up, <laughs> right? There's yeah. there's like so much talent. Right. Where sometimes you can be in some of these smaller cities and and quickly like establish yourself, and it's very easy to get comfortable. And I, right. I feel like that's, that's like the demise for a lot of people who who might have a ton of potential. But if there's no resistance, like why why would you push? You know, but that is so true. Like some of these bigger cities are so scrappy, and you get in, and you're like, I have all the credentials. I like I should be a, a perfect candidate, and it's just like, oh man, I gotta make something happen. <laughs> <laughs> but then it seems to me like you're the kind of person, like you said, as soon as you kind of saw the inner workings of it, you were like, oh, this is I'm interested in this, and I, yeah. it's been similar for myself. I worked for a lot of very small uh, family owned businesses when I was, you know, quite young, starting at like 16, 17. And I was just intrigued by every aspect of it. And I think there's just like, there's a certain personality type that just they're, they're like into it. And they just definitely go. and that's, you know, a lot of people ask, like, well, how did you become, you know, this and that? And it's like, some, sometimes you're just, it's just in you, you can't help it. You're like, I agree, totally, you're totally born with it. Um, and so when you when you first started Equilibria, what was what was the mission? What was the goal? Well, you probably would never guess this, but <laughs> it actually was a professional organizing company, Jeremiah. OK, so I was through a period of introspection, trying to figure out well, what do I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> <laughs> you know how it's funny how the universe can put into your path things that you need to see or read mm -hmm. or listen, listen to right when you need to receive that message. And that's that's literally how it happens. So every book that I happened to read around that time, early 2005, magazine articles, blog articles, videos that I might watch on YouTube, everything was was kind of preaching this message of we're all born with natural skills, talents, and abilities. But through this period of, and I'm gonna use the word indoctrination because I can't think of anything better, 
but it's, it's almost like a period of indoctrination that we go through in our educational system when you think about it, because we aren't trained to be independent, self-sufficient. You don't go to school to become an entrepreneur. Right. <laughs> but you do go to school to eventually get a job working for someone else. And so I started thinking, well, what is it that I'm naturally really good at? And it happened to be organizing. I thought whether I was flipping burgers as a teenager or working retail, you know, through as I worked through work my way through college and then ev eventually working as an engineer, what was it that always made me excel in any of those jobs? And it was the fact that I was organized, not that I was the the brightest star in the sky or the sharpest knife in the drawer. I just was very organized. So I thought, okay, I'll start a company where I organize, I organize people. And I discovered through a, an online search, there was this organization called the National Association of Professional Organizers. And it was also around that time when TV shows were starting to feature organizing things like uh, hoarders, which is still on to this very day. So it was that idea was starting to gain traction. And that's really what my company started as. And when you say organizing, do you mean physical layout or yes. and, and or uh, financially, or it was just more of a physical well, layout situation at first? It's funny you ask that because that's a great segue into how the company evolved into what it is today. Interestingly, most of my clients were entrepreneurs operating home-based businesses. So mm -hmm. it wasn't that they were, I wasn't going in organizing someone's garage or closet. Right. It was, right. It was mainly home offices. Mm -hmm. And here's what I noticed. You could make things look tidy, and this isn't a dig at Marie Kondo, but when you're talking about a business, a business being operated in a home office or any office for that matter, you can't necessarily look at an object or a piece of paper and ask yourself whether or not it brings you joy or does it spark joy? Because we all have to deal with the IRS. That doesn't tend to spark joy with many people, but we know we have to deal with it, right? So that's where things start to become challenging because you're trying to, you're trying to fulfill customer orders or you're trying to make sure you answer the phone. You're wearing all of these hats usually when you're in your home office so it's very easy for things to become chaotic physically. So yes, it involved making things look good or aesthetically pleasing, but you're right. There was another missing piece. They needed those processes and those systems to make sure that if things got chaotic again, they at least had a process that they could revert back to, to get things back in order. So that's eventually it shifted from this is more than just professional organizing. This is really helping to put in place an infrastructure where you're connecting the people, the processes, all of the different tools and the technologies that you need to to operate on a day to day basis and not just infrastructure, business infrastructure. So that's kind of how that evolution took place. Yeah, I had a hunch, which is why I asked that. I had the same conversation <laughs> last week on Clubhouse and ah. the person I was talking to, the same exact thing. And often what we find is like that that physical layout is just scratching the surface of much bigger underlying, you can call them issues or or opportunities um, yeah. for, for growth later on down the road. I'm um, curious, do, do you uh, use Clubhouse much at all? I, and it's funny because I've, I've been listening to your show and I was like, He's a big fan of Clubhouse, from what well, I can tell. I didn't mean to be, it just happened. <laughs> but. So, you know, I'll say this. Clubhouse, I, I first got on back in January and yep. it was great. Yeah. But here's the thing. I don't know if it's gotten better, but I remember being listening in on one session and don't get me wrong, it was phenomenal information. I was glued to my seat the entire time. It went on for three hours. <laughs> And that's and, short. <laughs> that's a short and the one. The <laughs> only reason I was able to do it was because it was it was on a Friday afternoon and I just had my schedule happened to be clear. But I was like, I can't do this yeah. every week. Definitely not every day. So I eh. yeah. and then the notifications. So that for me, 
you know, the notification. So as you start following people, especially yeah. who are very active on Clubhouse, my phone, the notifications are just coming. Yeah. Oh, dear God. So <laughs> I'm just I haven't curious. been on there in a while. I, I asked because uh, I was curious if you've come across my guy, Tony D on Clubhouse. Does no. that sound familiar? He, he no. hosted a number of pretty big rooms and, and he, okay. you, you, he says a lot of the same things, processes and procedures. It mm. all really comes down to that. He was one of my first bosses uh, in Virginia when I was 16 or 17. Oh, and, wow. And he's now franchised. He's got two eight figure businesses. And wow. yeah, uh, but he, this is all, this is the bread and butter of what he talks about. And it's the cornerstone of his success. So, wow. Uh, well, we're going to take our first break. We can pick back up with that and, and talk about the transition from Equilibria as a physical organizational you know, service to um, getting into finances and, and processes and procedures that really help, help people grow. And hopefully we'll get to answer Lance's question before <laughs> the end of the show. So everybody hang tight. We'll be back in just a minute. All right, folks, welcome back. If you're just tuning in, again, you are listening to The Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, we're zooming to Atlanta, Georgia, talking to Equilibria CEO, Alicia Butler-Pierre. She was just describing uh, in the first segment, uh, developing her company, coming out of the engineering uh, background with Monsanto, working for a small uh, mom and pop business, helping them uh, kind of understand better how to uh, operate and seeing the back inner workings of, of a small business and what it takes and then diving headfirst into her own uh, business where she was helping people with their physical infrastructure, but quickly learned as we most as most of us do once we get into business that there's that's just the top layer and that there are so many layers to your infrastructure and and why being organized and 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 decluttering like your brain <laughs> to to a large extent is what really helps businesses grow uh, survive first of all but then set the foundation for for potential growth so can you describe kind of what were the key indicators for you when you you, you were working in this physical space with these companies but you quickly realized oh there's something deeper here how did that transition play out well i knew i knew that they needed a method in place to make sure that whatever was was put into place, again, a, from an aesthetic standpoint, that they would be able to maintain it. So I've always been very big on maintenance. I didn't, I wasn't the type of organizer that might put you on a quote unquote maintenance plan where they come every two weeks or, or even once a month to make sure that they can maintain whatever they put in place to begin with. It's always important to me to leave whoever I work with empowered mm -hmm. so that they can keep it up and not have to become dependent on me. So that's where the process piece came from. And I would put together these little reports, nothing fancy, nothing long and drawn out, but it would just be a, a, a page in the report that would say, okay, this is how I recommend you maintain the, the systems that we've put in place in your home office. Step one, do this. Step two, do that. And, and what happened, Jeremiah, I did a lot of bartering my first year in business because I was in a brand new city. I didn't work here previously. I didn't come here to have a job working for someone else. I didn't go to school here, didn't have family. And like I said, I knew one person literally when I first moved here. So I just started networking. I, I hit the networking scene really hard and I started bartering. And what I would ask for in exchange for, let's say organizing your home office was a strong testimonial that I could include on the website and the ability to be, to be able to take before and after pictures that I could use mm -hmm. as part of a portfolio on the company's website. So after about a year of doing that, I, I happened to be featured on a local television program here in Atlanta. Nice. And it first aired in October of 2005. The theme was, or the topic was, organizing your life and beyond or something like that. And there were a few people that contacted me, but then it re-aired in January of 2006, right around the time of year when people are setting those New Year's resolutions with, aside from dieting, <laughs> another popular resolution for people is getting better organized. And someone contacted me. It was, it turns out it was, she, at the time she was, 
the district attorney for DeKalb County, which is, uh, for those who aren't familiar with Atlanta, 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 the core of the city of Atlanta really consists of two counties, Fulton County and DeKalb, and then there's the metro area, which is like 28 plus counties. So she contacted me herself. She said her name so quickly in her title and all I heard was her title and I thought I was in trouble. I'm like, oh my God, I've only been here for a year and the district attorney's office is calling me. What did I do now? Did I, did I illegally park somewhere? What did I do? But it turns out she had actually seen that program and she was interested in having me come in and work with her executive assistant wow. to develop a better system for organizing casework for all of the different attorneys. And that's when the light bulb went off for me, Jeremiah, like, oh, wait a minute. So it isn't just small company, small little, you know, mom and pop home-based operations that get disorganized. Larger organizations are disorganized too. And that just, that really feeds into how naive I was at the time because I came from an engineering background where there was always structure and, and process. You, you couldn't, you literally could not function at all if you didn't have a process because something might literally explode. So <laughs> <laughs> like truly, <laughs> and being that you're in the restaurant business, you can, I know you can appreciate this. I, I was listening to another one of your episodes with Chef Lizette, I believe, mm -hmm. and, and you, you all were talking about recipes and that's, that's really all processes are, yeah. are recipes right? You, there may be a dish at your restaurant that is absolutely phenomenal that I fall in love with. And if I try to go home and replicate it, I wouldn't be able to. So even if you told me the ingredients, even if you told me the steps, I still might not have the right equipment. There's all of these different factors. And that's all of the information that goes into creating a well-crafted process so that whether someone in your restaurant prepares that meal or I prepare it myself at home, it should come out roughly the same. And so having that, that opportunity to work with this DA's office, it literally changed everything. That's when I realized this is more than just organizing. This is business infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it just led to all of these other opportunities not just working with small businesses, but also nonprofit organizations, certain government entities, even much larger companies like Coca-Cola, where I eventually did do some work for them. Woo! That's awesome. <laughs> That's so. It's great when you set that goal, and it like it doesn't happen the way you expected, but right. you, you meander and you get there. Exactly. You go in through the back door. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> It's got to be sneaky sometimes. <laughs> so a couple of really great things you said, I just wanted to kind of point out. First of all, you were talking at the beginning of the segment about you, you want to empower um, your, your clients so that they're not reliant for you long term. I mean, sure, we'd all love to have, you know, just like a long list of people that just always are giving us money. That, but I think it really speaks to the essence of entrepreneurship and that's we want to help. Right. But we also and, and we'll get to this a little later because I have a, another question for you. Um, we we often we often get bored with order, right? <laughs> like we often we often are like, okay, I got this good, and that's why that I think that's why we're entrepreneurs because otherwise we would just get our one business and be like, okay, I'm just a business owner. Like I have my shop, I got my brick and mortar, and I'm I'm okay with this. But like we really like to solve problems. We really yes. in intensely like to help. And so when we don't have to anymore, we're like, okay, time to, I gotta go find somebody to help because it's just like, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's really deep inside of us in our, in our fabric. And it took me years to realize this. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think I realized this like two years ago and I thought, I thought I loved chaos and uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a student of martial arts, uh, mainly Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And my instructor at the time looked at me and he said, you don't like chaos, you like order. And I was like, what are you talking about, bro? Like, I like chaos. He's like, you <laughs> love to make order out of chaos. And as soon as something is orderly, you're off to the next thing. And it was, I was right. my brain was like that emoji where it's like, <laughs> I was like, 
was like, you're right, man. My sock drawer is impeccable. Oh, you know. <laughs> It, and I and I got that from you as soon as you said that you were like I really not that you just want to empower but you really enjoy the process of helping people and I think um, yes. for people that are like you know I want I want to become an entrepreneur like you have to ask yourself that hard question is how dedicated are you to the process of helping people and if if you really relish only when things are good like maybe you need to dig a little deeper and 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 see and then the other question was you know you were talking about uh, well the the thing that really helped you i guess it was this media exposure um through through this show and it it's, oh yeah it's a big testimonial for how important some form of media you don't have to be instagram famous you don't have to have like 10,000 followers on LinkedIn or be like on Clubhouse, 10,000 hours, just some <laughs> form of effective media goes a long way, right? I mean, that is scale in and of itself because with the single action, you get exponentially more exposure than you would if it was just you standing on a street corner somewhere with a sign like, hey, this is what I do. When you get when you get the media help, it, it really just like catapults your 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 name and your your service uh, all across the universe. So that was that was key to to that that big gig that you got um, with the government. Absolutely, you know, TV is such a powerful medium because not only can people hear you, but they can see mm. you also. And there's something there's something about our our brains as human beings where if we see you and we hear you somehow we think we know you and if we know you we almost instantly trust you and, so if i yeah. see you on tv oh Jeremiah, oh yeah jeremiah he's on youtube yeah i've seen him i've seen his channel and and he's there every week you know he's consistently out there so yeah i know i know him it's like no you don't <laughs> It's funny because in New York that happens all the time because there's so many famous actors that live around, you know, the city and mm -hmm. you'll you'll see somebody on the street and you're like, oh, I know that guy. What's up? And they wave and you're like, cool. And they walk behind and you're like, where do I know that guy from? And you're like, I actually don't know him, but you feel, you really feel like you do. And it, it is yeah. it is a testament to how powerful it is. Um, the other thing you said was. Um, Oh my God, I just, you, you know, you were talking about coming in um, to this world and, and you're seeing all these things, you're seeing that these, these companies and businesses all are kind of lacking. And I, I think most of us are, right? Like, Absolutely. there's not that many businesses that come in like an engineering department, like an engineering part, like you said, it thinks that there's huge liabilities where with that you mentioned earlier there is no entrepreneur class you know now some colleges are starting to talk about it but like yeah well we were growing up it wasn't a thing and 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 we get the metaphorical explosions <laughs> right <laughs> exactly. it's like you get in and it's not a really safe <laughs> environment but i feel like we all kind of come in that way and which makes a service like yours so necessary because there's so many people now starting businesses um i mean all the people that got laid off or realized that their yeah. job was actually not that secure and they have that itch and they're like man i've always wanted to start that baseball card company or whatever they're just like all right let's try it like they don't know they don't right. they have no idea the catastrophes that lie ahead but so we just go in because we're like well that guy did it and he was successful he's on youtube he looks happy <laughs> you know and and then and you get the you get the real look you know that's i'm so glad you mentioned that because it is very easy to look at you for example oh he has he has these restaurants he's been doing this for the past 25 years and He's also involved with with this, you know, all the, the wine, your wine adventures. I, I've been reading up on you, Jeremiah. Right. And so it's very easy to look at you and say, oh, well, OK, he did it. Why can't I? Yeah. But we don't have an appreciation for what's going on behind the scenes. And that's where operations is. Yeah. That's that's operations. What's going on underneath the hood? What's going on behind the proverbial curtain? It's not sexy stuff. It's not top of mind for most entrepreneurs, but we still, to your point, we still have those landmines. Even if you aren't working with in, in, in an industry that has, to your point, very high liabilities, mm -hmm. there are all of these threats that loom, that lurk 
that can take your company down. Yes. It could be something as simple as not having your book, your records in order. And God forbid, if you are audited and you can't produce or prove, and this happened to so many people last year when they were applying for those PPP loans mm -hmm. and, and now the chickens are starting to come home to roost and we, we're seeing all of these cases of fraud because they can't prove that they are who they say that they are, that they made what they say they've made and that they've used the money for how it was truly intended to be used. So never underestimate the power of record keeping, whether it's through, you know, Department of Labor, whether it's for the, the Internal Revenue Service. We all have some elements of our business that if we aren't careful, if we aren't making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed, it can certainly take us down, even if we're successful. Oh, yeah. Big time. All right. With that, we take a step back, take a break. You, you gave me a little agita. You said you start talking about the PPP. I'm like, I know. I'm like, are they here? All right. All right. Hang tight, everybody. We'll be right back. All right, everyone. Welcome back once again. The Entrepreneurial Web. We're talking today with Alicia Butler Pierre out of Atlanta, Georgia. She is the CEO of Equilibria and uh, helps businesses grow, helps them scale, helps them build infrastructure. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of alluded to it, but I just want to get like the short from you. Why is infrastructure so important for businesses? It sets the foundation. It sets a foundation that allows you to be able to grow and repeat the growth and sustain the growth profitably. You can grow, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to grow profitably. Mm -hmm. You can also grow by accident, meaning it's, it's not planned, there isn't a structure. And if there is no structure, you may as well have built your business. It's like building on a house of cards or building something on a foundation of sand and not a foundation of concrete. So it sets the stage that allows everyone to be on the same page in your company and it connects your people, your processes and all of the different tools and technologies that you're leveraging to make into a cohesive framework that you can replicate over and over and over again. Great, great answer. One of the things that I've discovered uh, over the last few years talking to so many entrepreneurs is that um, in general, entrepreneurs are pretty creative and, and are not risk averse. And we often just wing it, right? <laughs> you see a lot of people, yes. they're like, like a lot of us have gotten knocked around, you know? And so you're just like, whatever, man, I don't care, whatever the situation is. And, and you may survive like your first round in your business, but when you're talking about growth um, and doing it profitably, oftentimes, you know, entrepreneurs will say, well, we'll just figure it out the same way we did like through step one. And it, it doesn't always translate that way. Um, and, and I think it's even more of a reason why like services like yours are so important, especially at that, that transition from like, okay, we've got like headquarters or flagship. And now we're starting, you know, we're thinking of expanding, things are going good. You can easily just blow money out the back door and, and not even realize it if you're not, if you're not really uh, paying attention to everything or have somebody that that's doing it for you. Um, yes. Have you, have you seen that? Like that, is that, does, All that, the time. does that seem All the time. like an accurate oh statement? <laughs> yes, spot on. Um, you know, we may not go to school to learn how to become an entrepreneur, but we definitely go through the school of hard knocks, right? Yeah. You get beat up and, and truthfully, I don't care how much planning, you know, biz, you know, writing the business plan when you, when you first have this idea and you want to start up this new company, you can do all of the research in the world, but it's not until you actually start, roll up your sleeves, get out there, but make it in all. <laughs> how it feels, how it feels. <laughs> And I'm sure those who are listening who are in the trenches, we all know that feeling, but you have to just, you have to just get started and get out there and get knocked around. Mm -hmm. It's like throwing spaghetti at the wall, you know, using another cooking uh, reference here, but it, it truly is because you won't know what will work until, unless you try. 
And to your point, Jeremiah, I'm so glad you brought that up. We're creative. We think of new things. We think of new ways to, to promote our products and our services, and we put it out there. Now, what happens if one of those efforts that you're just kind of experimenting with, again, we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall, what if something actually sticks? Are you ready? What if you have an appearance on this radio show right now and for some reason there's something you say and all of a sudden there's a flood of traffic going to your website? Will it cause your website to crash? What if you get featured on Good Morning America for just two minutes, two minutes, but that two minutes alone can make or break your business? So that's when operations starts to become so important because if you, you can bring in, you can generate all the demand that you want for your business. But if at the end of the day, if you can't meet that demand, if you can't supply it, you're in trouble. We're dealing with that right now because of the pandemic. Think of how many, you know, I was, <laughs> I made another quick Starbucks run this morning for, for myself and my husband. And lately for the past several weeks, they've been out of oatmeal. They had it today, but but I mean, the alternative has been, okay, Starbucks doesn't have it. Let's go to McDonald's. They do have oatmeal. So, yeah. so it's we're all being challenged it, with our supply chains, especially the restaurant industry. Oh my gosh, the price of produce and meat, it's, it's, it's out of control. So it's all interconnected. And if you aren't prepared, if you don't have some of these basic core foundational things in place, when something like a pandemic happens, you'll just be caught off guard. And if you haven't been keeping up with the latest technologies, the latest trends and whatever your industry is, it will, it will come to rear its ugly head. And sadly, your company may not be able to sustain the blow. Right. And it can go both ways. It can come with excessive over demand. Or yes. as we saw with restaurants in the pandemic, as soon as the tide receded, people were quite overextended and it took no time to create uh, just a, a long list of casualties. So yeah. I feel like you always, that needle has to be able to move. Yeah, that's why, like, that's why my company is called Equilibria. It's, yeah. it's all about being, playing that balancing act. Yeah. You know, think about those companies that that were those restaurants, for example, that said, you know, we're not gonna just have our restaurant. We're gonna also kind of experiment with food trucks. We'll also make sure that people can order online. Those are the companies that were able to sustain that blow last year. But for those that were purely brick and mortar, they may not have had the same luxury. Yep, definitely. We saw it happen. It was tragic, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. All right, we're gonna take one more quick break and then I have my, my big final question for you. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so prepare yourself. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. We'll be right back. So I mentioned earlier in the show, I'm a student of martial arts, mainly Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And when I saw this, I was very intrigued. And, and a couple of things you said alluded to it throughout the show. What is a lean six sigma? Black I knew belt? it. I knew God, it. I like knew a, it. I've been what? all week. I've been like, I can't <laughs> wait to ask this. And when I saw, when I read about your background, I was like, oh, I have a feeling he's, he's going to- He's coming for it, he's coming for it. Okay, so Lean and Six Sigma are two different, we can, let's just call them to keep it very simple, process improvement and quality frameworks that are out there. Over the years, they were combined. Lean comes from Toyota. Okay. Six Sigma is a, a, is a framework that comes from Motorola. They've been combined. And so there's a certification program that you can go through where it's, it's all about process improvement, eliminating waste, minimizing defects and errors, especially if you are producing physical tangible goods. They have different levels of the certification. So there are some, there's one even called, I think a white belt where it's just basic like, hey, Jeremiah, let's just teach you some of the lingo of this, of this of this lean and six sigma world. Then there's the green belt where you, you're learning a little bit more about what it actually is, why it's important and how to maybe frame a project within your business or if, you're, if you work for a larger company, how to create an initiative, a project. You, you may see something that you think needs to be improved. 
and maybe at the green belt certification, which is where most people land. Black belt is where you start to really get into the math and the statistics and the data analysis of it all. So you may have a hunch that a certain process needs to be improved or to allude to what you mentioned earlier, you see something that you know is a problem, but it's still very surface level. When you start getting to that black belt level, I would then, if I were working with you, Jeremiah, I would say, okay, well, let me start looking at some of the data. So we think it's this, but what's truly the root cause? And it's not until I start looking at the data, making observations, actually being in your restaurant. I mean, you, we we're talking about getting in the trenches here, getting rolling up our sleeves, getting into the trenches with you to really figure out what are the root causes and now that we know the root causes, or once we know those root causes, how can we develop a plan of action to actually improve it? Sometimes it might mean the implementation of a new software technology. Sometimes it might mean inve investing in a certain piece of equipment, hiring certain types of people, providing certain types of training. It could be a number of things. And that's the, the black belt level. And of course, the highest level is the master black belt level. And that's where you've done several projects on the books, quote unquote, and depending on where you get the certification, you may even take an exam, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the highest level. It has nothing to do with martial arts. <laughs> well, the, the thing, I, I've said this many times, is that my, my experiences and the lessons learned in martial arts is what saved my business many times, even pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, so that by the time the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, it's just this again. It's just my adversary looks different. Um, but mm. but the martial arts, it, it, it's layered as well. So you see the surface level, it's about fitness, it's about self-defense, but you get deeper and deeper into it. And it, it just really becomes a philosophy and a mental state. And it is like the actual definition of the martial arts is making order out of chaos. And mm. so the two, I think, are very... You know, if you go to like a high level martial arts class and at the end they're giving you um, just like the thoughts of the day for you to go and be successful. I and mean, then you listen to like Tony Robbins or some of like the major mm -hmm. uh, business personalities. The messages are exactly the same. I'm wondering, like, I wonder how much, how much wow. martial arts those guys took. And they're like, that sounds good. I'm going to tell that to like <laughs> business people because it it works and i i always love to see people interlay the two because they're they're both very good for your life <laughs> yes it's both for like whether you're just trying to get fit and and have like good physical health or you want to be successful at your job at your company like the company you work for or if you're in business for yourself both will will benefit you because it, it's just frameworks for success like yeah, you. and I've yeah. I've always been interested in Taekwondo. Yeah. Don't ask me why. Of all yeah. of the martial arts, for some reason, I keep gravitating toward that one. So maybe once things fully open up again, I can I can start taking some classes. Yeah, it's it's excellent. It's always recommended, and and you really you will really find that it's it's eighty percent mental mm. and twenty percent physical. Now the physical work is hard at first. But after a while that, you know, it becomes, it becomes easier. And then it's really, you know, you're dealing with yourself, um, which is a great segue to Lance's question to see if we can get, get some feedback from you. What yeah. the most common problem you find preventing entrepreneurs from scaling? Not having those processes, not paying attention to their operations. And that's, it's something we've talked about throughout this, this interview. And it really is true. I've, we always, whenever I see these small business statistics about the failure rate, they're usually talking about it from a startup perspective. Oh, out of every, for every 100 businesses that started in 2020, you know, as a result of the pandemic, 70% of them will fail, you know, within the first three years. But what we don't talk about are those businesses that have been around for a while. They have a different type of problem. They have more business than they can handle they can still fail because they haven't taken the time to get the right people, the right processes and the right tools and technologies to make it sustainable. 
So again, what good does it do you to invest in all of this marketing and branding and PR and, and being on Clubhouse for 10 hours every week if you can't fulfill the orders, if you can't deliver your, your, your goods and your services consistently, if the quality, if the value isn't there, then it's all for nothing and you can still fail. That is what prevents people from scaling. It's also mindset. Not everybody can handle scaling because oftentimes, going back to your the martial, martial arts reference, you have to contend with yourself. You have to really look at yourself in the mirror and say, can I, okay, I, I took it from here to here, but can I take it from here to there? And you may not be the person who can do that. And, and being honest with yourself, that's that we're talking a completely different mindset now. For you to be able to say, you know what? I know this company can go even further, but I'm not the person who can get it there. Why don't I step down, maybe become part of an advisory board or the, the board of directors or, or have some type of position within the company, but I can no longer be the CEO. Maybe I become the COO or the CFO. So I would say those two things, Jeremiah, and, and to, to you, Dr. Lance, that mindset, you have to want to scale. And then once you've made up in your mind that you're serious about scaling, you have to get serious about your operations. There's just no working around it. Facebook didn't become Facebook by accident. Amazon didn't become Amazon by accident. I mean, Jeff Bezos is an engineer. That's not an accident. <laughs> Like he's wired that way to think in terms of process and operations. So if you don't like getting into the weeds, digging into the details, making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed, get somebody on your team who is that way. Exactly. And then focus on what you love doing, right? That's so that right. The, so that That's the, passion, right. the passion is still there. And yeah, I, I've always said it. It's like, you're, it's not your external competition. It's, it's you yourself, your internal yep. monologue and what you tell yourself and the, you know, the, the, the mindset, as you said, uh, that, that really, it starts there. Just like yep. your, just the way your business started, <laughs> you know, that's right. The, 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 the second level, level two, <laughs> level three, <laughs> um, that, that it's, it's still, it's still the same. It's still the same trick, but it just has a different face and, and you have to adjust to that. Um, well, we're going to have to wrap up here in just a moment. I want to take just the last minute or two for you to, you know, let everybody know like where they can find out more about you. If they want to get in contact with you, your, your best reference for, for your sure. business, for your brand, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much for that. The best place is to go to my website, my personal website, because it serves as a hub for the podcast, my book, as well as my consulting company and all of my social media links. And that is aliciabutlerpierre.com. So that's A-L-I-C-I-A-B-U-T-L-E-R-P, like Paul, I-E-R-R-E.com. And just link up with me there. I'm also very active on LinkedIn and Twitter. If you want to get on Clubhouse, let me know. I am on Clubhouse. Uh, just search for me again on any of those platforms under uh, Alicia Butler Pierre. And that's how we can link up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been really, really awesome talking to you and just tons of valuable uh, information. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I see so many people wanting to make this step now. And, and if, if you are in that position, like take, take her advice, all these things that she's talking about, it will, it will save you so many headaches and sleepless nights and probably some money too. <laughs> 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 You can always use a little more of that. <laughs> oh, it, it's really been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming. Thank on. you so much. These, this has been great. I had a lot of fun. Awesome. All right. Well, you have a great weekend. The rest of you have an awesome weekend. We'll see you next week. Peace out.